Hey, it's Dr. Joyelle, and welcome to the Women's Health Pearl Show, where we have real talk about real women's issues. We are here to talk about those things that we don't talk enough about. Menopause, vaginal dryness we talked about on the previous episode. Today, we are talking about sexual health. A woman's libido. Women are out here suffering in silence because they are not talking about their problems. Up to 40% of women are having some kind of sexual problems, and we are going to talk about those issues today. I am happy to bring back my friend, Dr. Efi. Welcome to the show, Dr. Efi. Hey! <laughs> I'm excited about this topic. We have women out here, we're talking to those women who rather take a nap instead of having sex. We are talking to those women who feel like I feel dead down there when it's time to have sex. We are talking to those women today. So let's jump into, we're going to talk about why women are having issues with their libido, whether it's decreased or there's a lack of their libido. And we're going to talk about some possible options as far as to helping them with this issue. So let's talk about first why. I want to talk first about the most common thing I find in the office, and I call it TDT. You want to guess what that is? Not really sure, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Too damn tired. <laughs> like, Ain't that the truth? <laughs> like, like women are wearing are all different hats. We are working outside the home. We work in, you know, inside the home with our children, with our husbands. We got our side hustles going on. We are taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. We, the sex is at the bottom of the priority list. So I think, you know, just life in general is a very common reason why women's libido, you know, decreases or, you know, kind of, you know, goes away. So what do you, um, what have you found as far as issues or reasons why women have Okay, so Dr. Joyelle, I'm so, so glad that you brought this subject up. It's something that women are absolutely suffering in silence about for so long. You know, maybe grandma or our moms have told us that, you know what, that's just not ladylike. You don't talk about sex. But, you know, a woman's sexuality should absolutely be celebrated and embraced. We are sexual beings and we're allowed to have feelings and we should have feelings. So when that feelings, those feelings are lost, it definitely is something that needs to be addressed. Several of the causes, you mentioned 2D, TDT, which I love because that is absolutely true. We're, women are such caretakers. We're working, we're caring for our kids, we're doing so much. And you're absolutely right. Some of the other causes, you know, there are some actual organic causes as well that women don't often feel comfortable talking to their physicians or their partners about. So I'm so glad that you're bringing this up. One of the main things, um, I like to kind of break it up into different categories, medical, psychological, um, and even, you know, um, and then uh, spiritual or um, emotional. So let's start with the first one, medical. That can be number one, really pain. You know, let's be honest, you know, the nature of being um, intimate, you know, for some women can be painful. I mean, oftentimes the very first time we're intimate, it can cause some pain, but there are structural causes in our vaginas. Sometimes there can be fibroids. Sometimes there can be endometriosis or just as the vagina is getting um, thinner as we get older, sometimes all of those things can cause pain. So if you have pain, you're certainly not interested in entertaining anybody. Um, so that can be a major cause for your libido to drop a little bit. Next, I think, um, you know, mental or emotional reasons. Um, and for that, you know, one of the things that happens, you know, if you're in a crappy relationship, if you don't like your partner, you don't feel like even being bothered with them. So that's one of the big things. Um, stress, as you mentioned, women are working. I mean, we, we are on the job. We're at the home. We're doing so much. And just as you said, TDT, too damn tired. And another one that I, I think is often overlooked, which is unfortunate, is trauma or abuse. So many women at some point in their life have suffered abuse or trauma, often at the hands of you know men. Sometimes it's intimate partners, sometimes it's family members. And sometimes because of the type of people, we, because we are the type of people who package things away and we put things on the shelf, we don't even realize that those um, 
terrifying or traumatic experiences can actually um, affect us long term. And then the last one um, is hormonal that I meant to mention. Just um, as we get older, um, our libidos go down because hormonally we're losing estrogen and we're losing testosterone. A lot of people don't realize that women's testosterone levels peaks in their 20s, in their mid-20s, and it continuously decreases until, you know, menopause. So we are our most sexual beings in our 20s, so we really need to, you know, embrace that. But we don't want to lose that either as we get older. And uh, the last time from a hormonal standpoint, right after you have a baby, first of all, you're TDT, you're too damn tired, right. but also your hormones change. And as your hormones are changing, you just don't have the focus on that. So there, you know, I always try to explain to patients that just because your libido is low now doesn't mean it'll be low forever. You know, you have to understand that things are evolving and they fluctuate and that's natural and it's normal. That's a good point, because I think some, sometimes women also just associate their decrease in libido with just, you know, aging and menopause. But there are premenopausal women who can experience a decrease in libido and they're like, totally like, what, what is this about? Absolutely. Um, and like you said, it definitely goes along with, you know, postpartum. And that's when they're, you know, in breastfeeding, there are changes in their estrogen levels that, that decrease in fluctuation in their estrogen level um, can affect their essential of their vaginal health and vaginal lubrication. And, you know, you know, besides TDT, they just don't feel comfortable down there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, yeah, those are great points. So let's talk about what they can do about it. So we know the blue pill for the men came out in the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. And women were like, where's our pink pill? Absolutely. Where is our pink pill? And we finally got one in about 2015. But there is, I personally, and I want to get your thoughts on, I personally don't recommend it a lot because of the box warning on it um, in regards to um, side effects. Women can have actually um, feel faint. There can be a drop in their blood pressure, um, especially if they drink alcohol along with taking this, this medication. So what are your thoughts on um, that particular medication as far as an option? Can we just say how sad is it that we finally get a drug that works and we have all sorts of side effects that are associated <laughs> exactly. with it? Exactly. I think it's a conspiracy when they don't want us to have sex. Right. <laughs> right. Great. Make up a great point. Number one, Dr. Joyle, I think that you know this is something that you should feel comfortable talking to your provider about. I absolutely agree with you. There's so many options for men and very few for women, but the number one thing we need to do is go see your gynecologist, unpack some of what might be going on, whether it's physical, whether it's hormonal, where, whether it's um, psychological. But yes, as you mentioned, there is the little pink pill, Philbasterin is the name of it. Um, it came out, I want to say about two, three years ago. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of box warnings. And in fact, you have to sign a special consent form to say, I'm not going to come back and, you know, and sue you folks if, I, if something bad happens to me. But yeah, <laughs> some of the side effects are nausea, low blood pressure, and also it interacts badly with some of the common medications that we use for things like vaginal infections, yeast infection medication. And you can't, you know, so if you, you know, oftentimes, as you know, if we're sexually active, you sometimes will get a vaginal infection and right. you can't treat yourself because you're using the medicine for treatment. It just doesn't really work so great. Um, so I'm with you on the same camp as you. I don't really use that medication. I think it has too many side effects. Um, and I don't think that, you know, most patients are willing to sacrifice, um, you know, their, you know, help for t to take a medication that's going to allow them uh, to be sexually active. But, you know, there's, and so as there's a second medication that came out last year um, called, um, I can't say the word, but it's an injectable, you know, um, it's a very long word. So I apologize. I'm not really great with saying that I don't want to use the trade name, but it's a medication that came out last year that um, is an injectable medicine. Now, I think this medication shows a whole lot more promise. And the reason why is you use it as needed. So it's very similar to the little blue pill that you take when you feel like you might be in the mood for men, but also now it's an in the mood medication for women. Its side effect is a little bit of nausea, but for the most part, it really works pretty well. I actually tried it. It does work. <laughs> That is awesome. You can 
definitely, you know, share your thoughts with your patients now. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, it only works for women who are premenopausal. So that's kind of the drawback. Right. So if you've already gone through menopause, this medicine won't work great for you. But, you know, I got a freebie uh, from the drug rep. And I said, you know what, let me just give this a try. It really does work. So ladies, please go talk to your doctors you need to get on that. Right. There are options out there. And I think it's funny that, you know, a lot of these medications that are coming out, they're really indicated for premenopausal women. When a lot of times, and like I said, I did mention that premenopausal women do have this issue, but postmenopausal women do too. So it's, you know, it's really interesting that a lot of these medications that they're coming out with are, you know, really studied in premenopause. Um, so, so yeah, so that definitely is a great option for women. And also, you know, if they didn't want to, you know, go that route, there's also, you know, more natural um, options. There's something that's a plant-based supplement that women can get, as well as something over the counter that has L-arginine. And these typically work by just stimulating the genital region. And that has shown just the stimulation they, to increase the blood flow to the genital region. So it increases their arousal and things like that. So those are also uh, other options that women can have. And, and that typically, like the, the injectable you mentioned, it works kind of, you know, as needed basis as opposed to the other ones. It, it can take a while for it to kind of, you know, set in. So, you know, there are options out there. And I want women to know that, you know, there's so, women, so many women experiencing these issues and not really seeing anything because they're just assuming there's nothing to do. And I think also... A lot of women are saying anything because they just accept it. Like, okay, this is how it is. As I get older, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna have a libido. It, you know, it is what it is. Because it's funny, I can tell you a story about a patient who I saw in the office a couple of years ago, and she was like, Doc, well, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm 43. And she was like, Well, you just wait till you get into your 50s, because you're not gonna want your husband. <laughs> I was like, What? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Like, wh what are you? What are you referring to? You know, your sex drive just goes down and that's just the way it is. I'm like, no, we need to kind of peel that back and figure out why it's happening. Yes, it happens as we get older, uh, but there could be other reasons why you can have a decrease in libido or a lack of libido. So it's really important to, you know, figure out what those potential reasons are and, you know, figure out what, what option is, is best for you. And I also think that, you know, just women in general, knowing about the options and knowing that they, you know, they do have options would be, they'll be more open to, you know, having that conversation um, with, with their doctors. I think it's empowering when you realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard when you think you have a realization that, you know what, this is inevitable. It's just not going to happen. But can you imagine the curtain is pulled, is pulled back and you can see the sunshine and you can say, oh, wow this actually can come back. I can actually do something about that. And I love that you talked about the herbal options because there are things that you can just go to your local herbal store, to your local Whole Food or My Organic Market and go on the shelf. Things like ashwagandha is another root that's really good for just kind of natural well-being. Because oftentimes, as we said earlier, one of the problems is stress. Right. And, you know, the fact that we are constantly moving in multiple different directions and we don't have the time to just kind of chill out a little bit. Ashwagandha is a fantastic um, root that really does help with that. And another one, um, CBD is also, mm. CBD is the um, non, the part of the, the, of the weed plant that doesn't make you high. Right. <laughs> You can get that from CVS. So I'm not saying go out and smoke weed. Right. Some people choose to, and that will chill you out as well. However, what I business. my patients who do use a lot of marijuana is that you can actually drop yourself your sex drive a little bit. It is a motivational. But the CBD portion is the relaxation portion that helps you to relax. So ashwagandha, CBD are great for relaxation. And some other of the herbs that you mentioned, one of them is called the maca root. Um, a lot of people put maca root in their shakes and things like that. That's really good for kind of getting those, as you mentioned, the blood flow and those special places going. So that really helps um, with kind of, you know, so certainly going and, you know, maybe, you know, consulting with an herbalist. 
to kind of help you to kind of search out some of those. So those of you that kind of want to be a little bit more, you know, natural and don't want to take a whole lot of medications, that's a great place to get started. Um, and as we were talking about, the other part is kind of looking at, you know, hormones, replacing some of the hormones that we um, are losing as we get older. Um, you know, there's lots of studies specifically on the hormone that's really good for sex drive and, you know, and motivation, testosterone. Um, we lose our testosterone again as we start getting older, but there are a lot of studies for FDA approved medications that bump up your testosterone made for postmenopausal women. It may not take you back to when you were 30 and 40, but it'll kind of get you back where to a place where it's a little bit more reasonable and you at least have some motivation. You may not get all your 20 year old motivation back, but you might get to your 40 year old motivation. And we're in our forties. I think we're doing pretty okay. <laughs> I agree. Maybe and our husband, we should ask our husbands. Right. <laughs> we'll bring them on the next show. We'll bring them on the Absolutely. next show. <laughs> but speaking of testosterone, you know, I do have some women, you probably do too, who come in who have had these testosterone pellets. And for those of you who don't know what those are, they're like little tiny pellets. It's the size of almost like a Tic Tac that's injected into the hip area or the bottom area. And it's basically to, you know, supplement uh, testosterone um, over a three month period. Now, what, what are your thoughts about those pellets? I mean, I have some women who had definitely benefit, benefited from it, and then some women who can have those terrible side effects of testosterone, like, you know, increasing hair growth in abnormal places or, um, you know, in, in, in large clitoris. Like, they have different side effects that they, they don't like. So what are your thoughts about the pellets? Yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of those. And the other problem is sometimes when they get injected, sometimes you can't find them when you want to go out and take them out. Right. Um, you know, I always tell my patients that anytime you have, and you know, the problem is those aren't FDA regulated, which mm -hmm. means that the governing body who regulates all of our drugs, it's kind of like a side hustle, you know, in my opinion. It's, you know, for many women, many women love it and they believe in it. However, the side effects, one of, as you mentioned, you know, the increased hair growth, the, you know, hair loss, it can sometimes lead to male pattern baldness, you know, prematurely, right. um, increase your risk of acne. You know, it's like all of a sudden you're like a, you know, 14 year old teenager all over again. But the other thing is it can cause overactivity of your, you know, of your ovaries and of your uterus. And so that can increase your potential risk for cancers in those areas. So I think it's a little bit dangerous. And the last area that it kind of affects is your liver. Um, right. Excess testosterone, your body doesn't know how to process that because, I mean, we're women, we're not men. So we can't get up to, you know, and oftentimes these pellets are really meant for men and you right. put a woman, it doesn't quite work the same way. So it puts our, it puts too many organ systems in jeopardy. So I'm not a huge fan. Dr. Joyle, you probably remember years ago, they had the little, um, the, the patch, the testosterone and estrogen patch. I love that one. That was really great. But it, it, again, it started causing increased levels of um, testosterone to unacceptable levels. So they had to pull it off. There's currently a bunch of study that's going on right now to try to figure out something that's similar to that, that is a little bit better controlled with some of the newer technologies that are around. So stay tuned, postmenopausal women. We got something coming for you. Hold on. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hold on, hold on, hold tight. <laughs> but going back to you mentioned, you know, women relax, you know, being able to relieve the stress and that could potentially help with the libido. I think that's also very important to note because I also promote like self care. Like they really have to, you know, figure out a way to pour into themselves so they won't feel TDT and get their, you know, improvement in their libido. So, you know, definitely taking time to themselves, relaxing, a nice bath, things like that. And also pour into their relationship. You know, there's women, you mentioned earlier, you know, a, women, a woman came to me and she's like, you know, my, my libido's not the same. And I'm like, well, how's your relationship with your husband? And she's like, well, I don't, I don't really like him anymore. Like, <laughs> okay, well, that may be a problem. <laughs> So definitely pour into the relationship or, you know, establishing where your relationship is during this process could be, you know, affecting your sexual health as well as, you know, date nights and things like that are also great. So, you know, definitely being aware of those things um, would help women in regards to, you know, figuring out what they can do to help with their, you know, look, in, improving their libido. 
I'm so glad you said that. You know, the most powerful man in the United States um, five years ago used to take his wife out on date night every every once a month. I told my husband that. I was like, you know, if President Obama can take his wife out on date night, you can take me too. <laughs> you are 100% correct. If you, I mean, for us, you know, for men, you know, intimacy is basically very physical. You know, I mean, a man can have sex with anybody, quite honestly, you know. <laughs> But for us, it really is, you know, it's where men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We are from a different planet. Our sexual desire and our sexual needs are multifactorial. They are emotional. They are physical. They are spiritual. And if we're not feeling the dude, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> no matter what type of medications or anything else we give you, it's just not going to happen. Exactly. So we have to also be confident enough, not just to talk to our providers, not just to pour into ourselves, but to have the conversations, not only also with our partners and say, look, dude, yeah. you're not doing what I need. I need you to do right. X, Y, and Z. And then we get the response that we're looking for. But it's a shared experience. We are not here to provide a service. We are here to also be equally filled and fed. And our partners are responsible for that. So whether that feeding happens to be a text during the day to say, hey, babe, I'm missing you, or, you know, you know, a, you know, a, just a whisper in the ear as he's walking out the door to say, you better get home and get ready or, you know, or a gift card to the to Victoria's Secret and say, surprise me, bring me home a secret, something, you know, or, you know, my favorite, a Louis Vuitton back. <laughs> that always works. <laughs> well, that was, you're leading into my, my last question here. I was going to say, what would be your message to the men out there or the partners of women who are having sexual problems. And I was gonna start with, you know, wash some dishes sometime, do some laundry. <laughs> Amen, sister. Amen. <laughs> Take the kids out of the house for like a day. Right. Right. <laughs> Be the house myself for one whole day. That would be awesome. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you mentioned, you know, women, we are complex beings. And, you know, I, I, I say this in my book, men are like microwaves and women are like ovens. You know, men, they are ready to go. We need time to warm up. Amen. So do not re remember the art of foreplay. Mm -hmm. That matters. <laughs> and if you're still having a problem, there are people out there that can help. Sex therapists are really just a fantastic resource. You know, they're, they are counselors and they can actually work specifically. So they're relationship counselors and they work specifically in helping issues in the bedroom. And I think that communication is the key when it comes to a low libido for a woman, no matter what your age is, whether you're 20, whether you're 50. If your partner is as invested in your sexual needs and your desires, then it's just a matter of time. You know, there are things that we can do to help the organic problems, but for the most part, they're often psychological and you need your partner to be equally invested in um, making sure that you get your needs needs met as well. Totally agree with you. The lines of the lines of communication need to be open at all times with your partner as well as your your doctors that you're, you know, that you're seeing for these issues. And there's so many things that can play a key role of why women's libido is affected. One is it it can be your partner. It may not even be you. It can, you know, be your partner. Are you even still attracted to your partner? So it can be that or exercise, like your exercise routine. Well, you want to talk about that, Dr. Ethi? What are your thoughts about exercise? Oh, I am a huge believer. In fact, as soon as we get off this thing, I'm going to go downstairs and work out. Honey, I'm about to get on my Peloton, girl. <laughs> but I love that you mentioned that because, in fact, today I had a patient who told me, you know, I'm just doing her regular well woman exam and inquiring, as I always do, about exercise. And she said, well, you know, I walk around and I'm thinking, okay, she maybe walks you know, like a couple miles a day. She was like, oh, I walk around my house. And I said, well, honey, that's not exercise. That's living. <laughs> I was like, you're supposed to move. <laughs> that's part of what you're supposed to do in life. And I think oftentimes people think, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I'm a waitress or I work in retail, so I'm on my feet all the time. And I'm like, do you see me walking around this office? I'm on my feet all the time. But I get up in the morning, every morning, and I work out for 30 minutes at least four to five times a week. Um, 
exercise, and I think especially for Black women, it's just, it's not something that we have grown up seeing our mothers do, or certainly our grandmothers doing, and it's something that's a little bit more new to us, but it is something that is a vital part of existing. You have to make time for exercise, and exercise needs to be at least three to four times per week, at least 30 minutes per time each time you do it, and your heart rate needs to get up to 130 or higher. You know, walking around your neighborhood, walking your dog is not exercise, and it doesn't have to be on on an exercise bike, it doesn't have to be a run. You can do a really fast paced um, speed walk or power walk, I think is what it used to be called. I often even tell patients to take weights, my older patients especially, who can't run or things like that anymore. And I tell them, take those little Velcro weights, put them around your ankles and your wrists and kind of you know, pump your arms up and down and do that power walking. You're getting strength training, you're getting muscle training. Um, and you're getting cardiovascular. Why does that all help? Because it increases your blood flow to vital organs. One of those vital organs being your heart, the other vital organs being down below. And all of that, the increased blood flow from your heart to your general region will help you with with increasing um, the stimulation and the desire that you'll have. So exercise is a key piece of the puzzle. Great point. And I have to tell you, ladies, sex counts as exercise. So exercise with your partner. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And even if, you know, I mean, I have seen lots of couples, you can see on Instagram and things like that, where you see couples working out together, doing push-ups together and breaking out to a hot, sweaty mess together, and then going upstairs and getting it started in the shower and moving on to the bedroom. You know, you, it it doesn't just happen in porn movies. It happens in real life too. So make your life like a porn movie. And (laughs) Spice it up a little bit, you know, kind of, you know, bring, you know, bring the sexy back, you know, get, you know, I have like, I have a playlist, you know, on Spotify, I have a a playlist, you know, and I call it the baby making playlist. (laughs) Not that I have any plans on making any more babies. However, you know, it's just those type of songs that are important to me and my husband and kind of get us in the mood. Those are other things. And sometimes we'll start that playlist during our workouts together. So think about that, ladies. And another thing, massage table. I have one of those. My husband probably will kill me right now, but uh, yeah, I highly recommend that. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm down for that. I have to get one of those. <laughs> Amazon. Amazon. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the girl. <laughs> Dr. E.P., thank you so much for this great conversation. This was so much fun. Always a pleasure with you, Dr. Joyelle. I'd love to be back anytime. <laughs> Definitely we'll have you back. And like I said, you know, the take homes for, you know, this is, you know, essentially ladies really have an open dialogue with your partner as well as your physician. You really have to advocate for yourself, you know, in, the, in your relationships with, you know, everyone. Your sexual health is so important. It affects you emotionally, mentally, and physically. And if you are having issues, it's really important to talk to your physician about it, talk to your healthcare providers to see what, first of all, what is the issue? Because a lot of times it's not just a quick fix, take this pill and you're good. It can be multiple things that can be going on. So it's really important to delve into those issues and figure out what options that are available would be a good option for you. All right, Women's Health Pearls, thank you so much for watching. Remember to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Joyelle to find out what we'll talk about next. Until next time, where we have real talk about real women's issues. Mm -hmm.